This is great. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. I want you to go there with me in your Bible, your digital device, or read it on the screen. But it says this. It says this. It shall come to pass, in verse 27, in that day that his burden shall be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now, let me talk about this. Let me talk about this. I do believe in instantaneous anointed moments where you're free. We've experienced it. You know what I'm talking about? The Spirit of God touches your life. You're free. But this scripture, although that that does have the principle of the Spirit of God touching your life and you being free, that is not what this scripture is talking about. The scripture is talking about political and governmental oppression. But there is a major takeaway here. Because the Spirit of the Lord speaks through uh, shadows of the Old Testament into the New. And so we recognize this. So please hear me right now. What it's talking about, it's saying that the people of God were under a wicked dictatorship's thumb. But suddenly, the favor of God, the goodness of God, the life of God, the favor and the goodness of God, gets on people and they begin to grow. Because what it's talking about when it says the anointing destroys the yoke, one word in some translation calls that fatness. Another one basically refers to the muscularity. And what it's talking about is the picture of like an oxen with a yoke around its neck and it begins to grow and become so muscular that the yoke begins to crack. It begins to loosen and it finally becomes completely destroyed that it can't even be put back together again. It's talking about there's a day coming in your life and the body of Christ's life, if we want to apply it, that there's a day coming that you will grow in maturity. You will outgrow your problems. You will outgrow the yoke. The church of Jesus Christ will outgrow things to such a level that we literally bust the yoke. But here's what happens. It comes in stages, and this is where people really struggle. So it's in three stages, 30, 60, and 100 fold. We know Mark chapter 4, verse 8, it speaks of 30, 60, and 100 fold, okay? That when seed hits the ground, it springs up some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And it's God's will that we go to 100 fold. Okay, so when it's talking about the yoke breaking, there's three steps in it. It says that they begin to grow, this muscularity happens, this anointing, this power of God gets on them, the calling, the marking, the unguent, that anointing, the smearing for God's purpose in your life, you begin to grow, and a lot of people feel the yoke lift at a point of growth. And they think, I'm lighter. Woo! I'm lighter. I'm free! I am free to run, right? I am free. They're free. And they think that's it. And a lot of people stall out at their first sign of a, a lifted yoke. The first phase. It, sh it lifts off the shoulder, right? Comes up off the shoulder. But then it goes beyond that. A lot of people get stuck there. The second phase, and this is where most people remain, it looses off the neck. What would that do? It returns to you your sight of vision. You can turn your neck, you feel lighter, you can see around, and you think, I am free. It's over. Yeah, I got some stuff going on in life. I got things happening. I got some containment. But you know what? I'm lighter and I can see, brother. I can see. I got my vision. 30, 60 fold. Until finally you get a revelation. And a revelation comes to you. And the revelation of the finished works of Jesus, a revelation of what Jesus has for you, a revelation of your destiny, a revelation of your future. And the Word of God ignites that like a powder keg. And suddenly that purpose, that call of God on your life begins to just explode. Now you have a lighter feeling. You can see, but the Lord begins to take you where you're going and you step into the fullness of your calling, your mandate, and you outgrow the yoke completely. You cannot be contained. And God is taking you to a hundredfold and breakthrough will happen. What does that mean? It means that there is a perseverance that must happen where you rise up, and that comes through everything I'm teaching you this morning. 
where a perseverance comes on you where you say, I will attain the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living no matter what. Maybe it's a healing journey. Maybe it's a prosperity walk. Maybe it's a destiny scenario where you're trying to find your, your victory. Maybe you're trying to find a spouse. Maybe you've lost a spouse. Maybe you're trying to get your children's and prodigals to come home. Whatever it is, you are destined to mature and outgrow the yoke, and it comes by revelation. Thank you, Jesus. Man, God is so awesome. He's so powerful. The Spirit of the Lord is here. 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 The of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. The Spirit of Almighty God. The Spirit of Almighty God. Jesus is Lord. I believe God is beginning to loose things off your life right now. With a hope of future and some raw spiritual horsepower. I believe God is turning the corner in many of your, your narratives and your story. There's a turn of the narrative right now coming on many of your lives. There is life and liberty and freedom. And many of the things that have opposed you and resisted you are now going to have to let go. As a matter of fact, right now, in the name of Jesus, everything that has tormented your mind, that has tormented your heart, that has kept you in captivity, kept you at 30 and 60, kept you from exercising your senses to discern what belongs to you. I right now, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose name I stand, in the name of Jesus, I access the authority of heaven, and I command everything that has held you bound, right now, in the sound of my voice, to release you, release you, release you. Be gone in Jesus' name. And right now in the name of the Lord, everything lost, everything lacking, every disturbing thought, every sleepless night, every tormenting thing that's been hitting your life, right now in the name of Jesus, it leaves you. It leaves you. It leaves you no more night terrors, no more unrest, no more anxiety, no more crisis fatigue. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man, if we knew how much Jesus loved us, we wouldn't have some of these issues. I'm telling you right now, if we knew how much Jesus loved us, we wouldn't have some of these issues. I think Jesus was a very joyful person. I don't think he was all full of trepidation and fear and all that. I think Jesus was filled with joy. You know, when Jesus walked into a town, when he walked into town, he didn't send a hundred intercessors in to clear the air. I'm sorry, it's true. Get this picture. Here's Jesus. Jesus comes walking into Jerusalem. He wasn't walking in with the boys, right? He's like, hey boys, how are we doing? Oh, here's Jerusalem. He's like, hold it, boys. You feel that? You feel that oppression? I feel the oppression. Devil's in town. Can't go in today. <laughs> Better go back and do some intercession before we enter Jerusalem. Let's come back in 40 days. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's not what Jesus did. Jesus came in and said, Hey! All you punks, get out. The sheriff's in town. That's what Jesus did. He knew who he was. 
That's when he's having that dialogue with the Pharisees and they're going back and forth and back and forth. And the Pharisees are looking at him and they're like, you have a demon. He's like, what'd you say? <laughs> John 8, you have a demon. You only say these things because you're possessed with the devil. He's like, I talk to my father and you only dishonor me because you dishonor him. You don't know my father. And they're like, who is your father? If you, if you are who you say you are, just tell us plainly. He said, I have been, but you don't listen. And then it goes further, and he begins to say to them, you're of your father. They're like, Abraham is our father, and we've never been uh, captive to anyone. We've never been a slave of anyone. Well, the last I checked, they were a slave in Egypt. And they're like, we've never been a slave of anybody. Abraham's our father. And Jesus said, no, you're of your father. And they came back at him, and he went back at them. And I love the progression. Jesus keeps drawing them in, drawing them in. And finally, he said that really blessed statement to them. He's like, you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> and he was a murderer, and you want to murder me because you take on his native attributes. And he was a liar from the beginning. When he speaks, native tongue is lying. He's a liar. His native tongue is to lie. And so they got enraged. And he said, and I tell you, Abraham rejoiced when he considered my day. And they said, you are not yet 50 years old. And you say you are greater than Abraham? Because he said, one who is greater than Abraham is here. <laughs> They're trying to tell him, tell us who you are. He's telling them, one who's greater than Abraham is here. And finally, they get right down to it. I love it. And Jesus looks at them. And they said, are you, you're not yet 50? And you're saying you're greater than Abraham? He said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. And with that, they decided to have a rock concert. They found stones, right? They went to go get stones. And Jesus, it said that he disappeared from them. He just walked through their midst. They couldn't get him because his time had not yet come. That was miraculous. You know, you get in the middle of an angry mob, you don't just disappear. Jesus did. He's like, not today. That time's coming. It ain't today, you punks. He told them. He said, you will die in your sins in that same chapter. He said, if you don't believe in the one whom he sent, you will die in your sins. And that made me cry. You know, I thought, Jesus, aren't you evangelizing these guys? He's the ultimate evangelist. He's like, no, nope, you're going to hell. I mean, think about it. He said, if you don't accept me, and obviously you're not going to, you dishonor me. You will die in your sins. And Jesus, he had quite a way with people. He just said it. But Jesus loves us. And he was a force to be reckoned with. I thought about this. They couldn't have killed Jesus if they wanted to. You know that? They could not have killed Jesus if they wanted to. He said on the cross... No man takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. They could have cut that man in half and he wouldn't have died. He was all life. He was 100% man, 100% God. I love it when Peter, Peter goes sideways on Jesus, right? <laughs> They're in that moment in Garden of Gethsemane. The power of God hits that place. Jesus says again, I am. There's seven I am statements of Jesus. And one of the seven I am statements, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. They come to get him. This whole military regiment comes to get him. Like nearly 700, 600 plus foot soldiers come to get Jesus. Where is Jesus of Nazareth? The one they call uh, Jesus. And he said, I am he. And in the Greek, it's only I am. And it says they drew back from that when he said, I am. I mean, in the Greek, it's not there. He is not there. I am. And when he said, I am, that was the same I am on Mount Sinai. No, I don't think you understand who I is. <laughs> I am. And I believe Jesus had wrestled with some of that through his whole life. He knew who he was. But then when the rubber really met the road, the metal was meeting, right? It was coming down to that point. Jesus came to the conclusion that I really am God in the flesh and I must go die for humanity. And in that moment when they came to get him, he said, I am. 
I don't think you understand. I am. I'm God. And when it happened, a blast of power came out of him because it says in John 18 that those soldiers that were with him and Judas, they drew back and fell to the ground. They got slain in the Holy Ghost. It wasn't an act of reverence. They came with pitchforks and torches, swords. And Jesus like, I am. And they're like, man, power of God knocked them all down. And in that moment, Peter springs up, notices this is my time to shine. He sees a sword, I think. Ha ha. Right? And Jesus is like, what you doing, Peter? And he's just like, stay over there, Lord. I got this. And he, and, uh, he springs on Melchus. Yeah! <laughs> right? Chops his ear off. Chops his ear off. Peter gets stopped by Jesus. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. These things are happening. And here's a word in this right now for somebody. In that moment, when Peter chopped off the ear out of zeal for the Lord and did all these things, Jesus moved him out of the way, scolded him, grabbed Melchus's ear, and smacked it back onto his head. Whose faith was that? Well, let me say what this is about. Sometimes, when you're doing something ridiculous, but it's for the Lord and it's for zeal, and you kind of go, uh oh, there are times the Lord will fix the issue. Because that was a capital offense for Peter. You struck a soldier, you're dead. They were going to kill him. And Jesus is like, I'm going to build my church if you're doing this crazy stuff. <laughs> and Peter's like... <laughs> slaps the ear back on the head. And in that moment, Melchus is instantly healed. What's Melchus going to say? He cut my ear off. What's he going to say? He hurt me. I, I'm fine. <laughs> Jesus took the ear and put it back by his own will because he was covering over a terrible act and removed all the proof it ever happened. How many of you need that? We all do, amen? There's times you go, oh, Jesus. Now listen. The Spirit of the Lord is raising up a Holy Ghost army. The Lord told me this year was a do-over year. It's a do-over year. 2020 was one thing. This year is a do-over year. And we're going to see do-overs. But in the do-over, even the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl. We went into overtime. Pastor Mark Cowart, dear friend of mine, he, he said, there's a word in this, brother. And I said, there is a word in this. They went into overtime and won. Because all this word about the chiefs, the chiefs, the chiefs. I believe we're going into overtime. Could involve the Could involve an extended mess. But I want to tell you something. I don't think that this is the end. I think we're going to go through redemptive instability. I think it's going to shake, rattle, and roll. And I think that's why we got to have clear-eyed, clear-mindedness, stand in the Word of God, get bold in the day of adversity. It says in Hebrews, if my righteous one shrinks back, my soul, God's soul, His mind, His will, His emotions has no pleasure in that, in them who shrink back. If my righteous one, meaning the ones who are my sons and daughters, and they stand up and they're full of God, when adversity comes, it says, if they shrink back, my soul has no pleasure in them. It doesn't mean God's mad at you. It doesn't mean God's trying to get you. He's just saying, come on. Don't you know who I am? Do you know who you are? Don't make me put the ear back on. Let's get to work. And the Lord is saying that to many of us right now. He's going to raise up what I call the remnant. It's, or, or the red church, because it is a remnant. 
The remnant is what he's raising up, and that's what I call the red church. It means Revelation 12, 11. They overcame the evil one by the blood of the lamb, going red, the word of their testimony, and they love not their life even unto death. They don't shrink back in the day of adversity. When you're looking at this, this whole seven parts of salvation, I might as well just write going red. Because every covenant thing his blood paid for in Sozo and Soteria, saved, delivered, preserved, protected, provi provided for, healed, and wholeness, that's all part of the covenant. So when we say going red, this is what we're talking about. I want to tell you about an amazing opportunity that has just been presented to us. We've had a supernatural door of opportunity open for us. Only God could do what is happening for this ministry right now. And it is involving television, network television, satellite television, going all over the world. Now, there's a lot in store for this, but let me explain. This is a word God's given us to reach a billion people for the gospel. And I feel an urgency for this coming year to advance and go forward because of the uniqueness of what God has spoken in this ministry and through this ministry in media. And here's what we have to do. To accomplish this, we not only have to buy the airtime, but we have to build out a call center and finish this building. And we are in the middle of it right now, but the timeline has just been sped up to fall time so we can be ready for the first of the year when we're gonna to begin to launch out in television in a monumental way. Now we've had an opportunity that is both fiscally responsible and financially amazing the way God has done this for us. And we have to take opportunity right now with it because it won't last long. So here's what I'm asking you. Would you consider supporting us helping us build out the call center, helping us finish off this building, and helping us with the budget of airtime. And it is gonna be a monumental thing, and the Lord has given us favor, and I can't wait to tell you more and more about it. But if you would consider partnering today over this, I know we can hit this target, I know we can walk through the door, and I know we can raise up a million to go win a billion. And I'm telling you, this is a God moment. It's a now word. And I'm asking you if you'd consider partnering with us over it. Maybe you want to become a partner, or if you are a partner, maybe you'd consider increasing your partnership today or giving a one-time offering. This is an amazing open door for this ministry and this broadcast. Everything we've prayed about, everything the Lord has told us to do is now coming to this monumental moment. Next year, we're going to reach the masses like never before, but we need your help. Please consider going to josephz.com right now and supporting